everyone. And once again, we want to say a happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers. Uh, so good to have uh, Sister Ruby's mother with us, Miss Geneva. I This morning, I failed to mention that my mom has made it into town and my sister was there this morning. And so we're grateful to have them here with us, grateful for all the women and all the mothers uh, today. I want us to dive right back into our study, our lesson that we began uh, this morning and continue to look at our text in Titus chapter two, in particular, verses three through five, where Paul is giving Titus some instructions, some things that are proper, that are in accord with sound doctrine, doctrine that is spiritually healthy and wholesome. And in this particular section of scripture, Paul is giving Titus some exhortations uh, to help those in the church to be godly in their conduct. He has exhortations for the young and the old, the male and the female, as it pertains to helping them to understand how they are to conduct themselves in the household of God. We are focusing on what he has for the older women and the younger women because it is Mother's Day. But in particular, as we look at the text, we look this morning at some sound doctrine for the older women. And we saw just how important it was for the older women to be reverent in their demeanor, for them to not be slanderers or false accusers, not to be enslaved to alcohol, but to be teachers of good. And what my aim is, what my aim was this morning was to impress upon our minds the powerful position of influence that a woman wields in the home and in the church. But if the woman is to wield that power in the way that God wants her to, she has to be a godly woman. And that takes preparation. It's so important for her to prepare herself because God expects for the older women to be teachers of good, to train the young ladies in their Christian duties, to train the young sisters in their responsibilities as a woman, as a wife and a mother. They have to be schooled wisely. And so as we continue in Titus chapter three and in verse number four, Paul tells Titus that the older women are to teach, they are to guide, they are to instruct, they are to encourage and train the younger women, first and foremost, to love their husbands. Now, the word here for love is not agape, it is phileo, which means this is more of a friendship type of love. The definition is more nearly or closer to the idea of tender affection to teach the younger women to love their husbands, to have a tender, affectionate, and loving devotion to their husbands. But you see, this means so much more than just giving him a pat on the back or a kiss when he leaves for work. You see, when we think about the older women helping the younger women understand what it means to love their husbands, a particular verse comes to mind, and it's Ephesians chapter 5, and verse number 33, you see, the older women have to help the younger women understand that when you're trying to spell love to a man, you don't spell love to a man, L-O-V-E, no. When you're going to spell love to a man, you spell it R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 31, or 32, excuse me. The Bible says in this passage of scripture where uh, Paul is talking about marriage, he's talking about Christ in the church, he says in verse number 32, this is a great mystery, but I, can, I speak concerning Christ and the church. Verse 33, nevertheless, let each one of you in particular 
see that he love his wife as himself. He tells the men, you make sure that you love your wife as you love yourself. And you would assume that he would tell the wives to make sure that you love your husbands. But what does he say? He says, men, you love your wives, but you wives, let you make sure, let the wives see that she fear, that she respect her husband. You spell love to a man. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And so when the older women teach the younger women to love their husbands, they're teaching her to show that she really respects him by acknowledging his headship in the home. And we'll deal upon or deal with that later. They teach her how to be a supportive wife how important it is for her to refrain from criticizing and contradicting her husband in front of others. One of the most unloving thing that a woman can do to a man is to disrespect him, especially in public. You see, a loving wife, she brings her husband honor not shame. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse number four. The word of God says an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. She's his crown. But she who causes shame is like rottenness. She who causes shame is like cancer in his bones. And the quickest way to destroy a man is to disrespect him. You see, a loving wife secures the trust and the confidence of her husband. Look at the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31 and verse number 11. It says that the heart of her husband does safely trust in her. Therefore, he shall lack no gain. You see, the, the loving wife who loves her husband, she earns his praise. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs 31. Verses 28 through 31. And I like the way that it, it's read in the New King James Version. For he's speaking of this virtuous and this godly woman. It says, her children, they rise up and they call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Listen to how and why he praises her. He says, many daughters have done well, but wife, you have excelled them all. You are the best of the best. He says, charm is deceitful, but beauty is vain. You know why beauty is vain? Because as one version says, beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. She earns his praise. But one of the greatest things she could do to earn his praise is by being a woman that fears the Lord. The older women teach the younger women that the greatest thing you could do to love your husband is to love God. I say it time and time again. It's a principle in 1 John 5, 2 and 3. Here's how we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For to love God is to keep his commandments. And the greatest thing a wife could do to love her husband is to love God. Before we move off this point, I have to address it. Because see, the older women teach the young woman to show affection and tenderness and love to their husbands. And so they train them and help them to understand how important it is to render due benevolence and due affection to their husbands. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You see, these are some passages we don't, we don't always like to read. Uh, we don't always like to read these, but they're still in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, chapter 7, excuse me, beginning in verse number 3. It says, the husband should give to his wife, the English standard says her conjugal visits, her due benevolence, the affection that's due to her. And likewise, the wife to the husband, 
For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement, and that for a limited time. Why? That you may devote yourselves to prayer. Some versions say fasting and prayer. You don't deprive one another, not because you're, you're mad or you're angry. You don't use it as a weapon to get your way, no. You don't deprive one another unless it's agreed upon and for a limited time. Why? To devote yourself to prayer and fasting. But then you come together. So that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. What am I saying? The older women help the young women understand that their husband has a certain thirst for affection that only she can and should satisfy. And so therefore, she ought to allow him to abundantly drink from her fountain. I was at a marriage seminar. And the title of the lesson that the gentleman was to do a lesson on, and, and I'll be as discreet as I can, was how to put the fireworks uh, back in your romance. And the gentleman was very nervous about it. It was a topic that he, you know, he was kind of bashful about. But he went to the word of God and he went to the words of Jesus. And he gave a simple message for how a man and a woman could keep the fireworks in their romantic relationship. And you can read those words in Mark chapter 10, verse 36. In Mark chapter 10 and verse number 51. And quite frankly, the attitude that the loving wife has, as well as the male, and putting those fireworks there, is what would you like me to do for you? You talk about do benevolence, you talk about fireworks. When you got a man and a woman, when their mindset is for their spouse, for the love of their life, in that context, what do you want me to do for you? And so we'll move on from that point. The older women, they teach the younger women to love their husbands, but not only that, they should uh, teach the younger women to love their children. Once again, the Greek word there is phileo. So it's talking about having a tender affection with and for their children, that they'll properly love and care for and be affectionate to their children and be affectionate as mothers. It's so important. Sometimes we think these things come naturally, but women have to be taught how to love their husbands. They have to be taught how to love their children. You see, a, a woman who loves her children, she's going to work with her husband to train and to restrain the children in the right way. Ephesians 6 and verse number 4, it tells fathers not to provoke their children unto wrath, but to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to bring them up in the training and the discipline of the Lord. And certainly a godly woman wants to do everything that she can to assist in that process. She wants to read the word of God to her children. She wants to pray with them because she wants her children to be like Timothy was. You see, the Bible tells us in 2, 3, 2 Timothy 3, chapter 15, that from a child, as a babe, Timothy knew the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make him wise unto salvation. You see, that faith that was in Timothy was instilled by his mother and his grandmother, 2 Timothy 1 and 5. 
And so the godly woman wants to do everything that she can to mold her children for the Lord's service. Rather than the service of the world, for the Lord's service. Rather than the service of the world. You see, she loves her children by disciplining them firmly and fairly. You see, sometimes and fathers can be this way. Trust me, sisters, there's a lot I can say about us men, and I'm going to get to us at the appropriate time. But oftentimes, mothers can spoil their children. Uh, sometimes they have this mindset that by spoiling them and not punishing or, or disciplining them, that somehow that is loving, okay? You know, we have so many, and I talk about it on Wednesday night with these gurus and all these psychologists that tell us that spanking and the rod, it, it just ruins children. But what does God have to say? Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 24. The word of God says, he that spares his rod hates his son. But he that loves him chastens him betimes, is diligent to chasten and discipline him, disciplines him promptly. You see, when a mother or a parent fails to restrain and train the child and to discipline them appropriately, that is not an act of love. The Bible says that that's how you show hate and disregard for a child. And many parents will be made to realize at the last day that perhaps they were the worst enemies of their children and led them to their ruin because they did not discipline them firmly and fairly. Proverbs 29 and verse number 15, the rod and rebuke, they give wisdom but a child left to his own, a child without discipline, it brings shame to his mother. So the older women teach the younger women to be loving and affectionate wives and mothers. And this is so important. I've got to touch on this because it's missing today. You know, as I said, we used to, I used to always think that women were just born naturally affectionate. But you know, I see kids nowadays who have to beg their parents for, beg their moms for a hug. They have to, that they're thirsty for an I love you from their moms. That their moms don't even give them a tender kiss. You know, they used to say mama's baby and daddy's maybe, and it's never right for any parent to abandon their child. But it used to be a given that no matter what, a child could rely on and depend on his mom being there. But that's not the case anymore today. It's not. You look around, there's so many young mothers who abandon their children. They're unloving. They're not tender. They're absent. I'm saying if that tender affection was there, they'd never be cruel or abort their born or unborn child. They wouldn't abandon them. So this is certainly something that has to be trained and instilled in our young women. But not only that, he continues to go on in the text. And I think it's worth noting that the first thing that he tells the older women to train the younger women in, which is in accord to sound doctrine, is to love their husbands, is to love their children. Their first duty is to make their home happy on the basis of love of the husband and the children. But not only that, he goes on, they are to teach the young women to be sober-minded, some versions say, to be self-controlled or sensible. 
that they are to be individuals who exercise self-discipline. They are to teach the young women to be wise and to be careful in their conduct, realizing the importance and the seriousness of life, even though they're young. They to teach them the importance of disciplining their freedoms, of restraining all their passions and desires and bringing them under the control of the will of God. They are to teach them to be discreet and also to be chaste. Simply means pure, innocent, pure and innocent in their bodies, in their affections, pure from worldliness and sin, training them and teaching them and encouraging them to avoid impurity in thought and word or action, pleading with them not to contaminate themselves by violating God's word. I mean, you talk about being discreet. When you talk about being chaste, this is very important for young men, young women, excuse me, married or single. There's a need to be discreet and chaste in their behavior. For those who are married, they need to be discreet. They need to be chaste, disciplined, and pure so that they can stay faithful to their husbands and true to their marital vows, keeping the marriage bed undefiled, Hebrews 13 and verse number four. Marriage is honorable and all, and the marital bed undefiled, but whoremongers, God will judge. Being chaste and discreet is very important also for single women. You know, in a more restricted sense, chaste not only means pure, but it has in its uh, definition the idea of being virginal. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 34. And I want you to see how the Bible, the words it uses to describe the difference between a married woman and an unmarried woman. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse 34. This is the New King James. It says there is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Did you catch that? There's the married woman and then the, the married woman is called a wife and the unmarried woman, what is the word that's used to describe her? She is a or should be a virgin. If a woman is not married, she should be a virgin. And if she's not a virgin, she should either be married or have been married at some point in time. And our young women, and I have a daughter, she's young, but if life lasts, she'll be older. They need to be taught the importance of chastity, of keeping yourself pure that you are not some man's good time. You are not some man's cheap thrill. You are saving yourself to be holy to God and to be a suitable man's wife. Wife. And you see, this is so important. This one principle if young women really understood it, and if they really grasped it, it would save them so much misery, so much heartache, so much emotional toy. You know how quickly young ladies can sift through the riffraff with all these men that don't mean them any good by simply being chased. So many knuckleheads would leave them alone. They couldn't even appreciate the discretion and the chastity. They save themselves so from being intertwined with knuckleheads just by this alone. Just by this. 
I had, I was talking to a gentleman and I'm taking my time a little bit. Please forgive me. He, his son, his, his child's mother was appalled. She was like, they found out that their 18 year old child, 17 year old child was having sexual relations. And she was just flabbergasted. She was taken aback and she mentioned it to his dad. And he basically said to her, well, when you, you had him when you were 14, you were a 14 year old pregnant mother. And so therefore, how can you say anything to him about having sexual relations as a teenager? And he's dead wrong. Oh yes, yeah, she, she need not deny that she made a mistake and had a child out of wedlock, that happened. But by no means should she be encouraged to encourage her child to repeat that behavior. The wise mother, the wise woman would say, yes, I made that mistake, but here's why you don't want to walk in my footsteps. First of all, it violates God's word. And let me tell you all the hardships and the challenges and the difficulties it caused. Yes, we made it to God be the glory, but don't follow that example. Write these verses down. I'm moving on, I promise. Leviticus 19, 29. Leviticus 21, 7 and 9. Deuteronomy 22, 21, Deuteronomy 23, 17 and 18, Judges 19, 2, Proverbs 23 and verse 27. I could read and mention many more, but here's the point I want to make, that we have to help our young women understand that in those verses, especially in the King James Version, you will find a word that is used for a woman who commits fornication. It has nothing to do with how many people she's been with. It has nothing to do with how many, with how many times she's done it. If the woman commits fornication, there is a word that is used to describe her. Your version may say harlot. Whether she does it for business or for pleasure, it could be prostitute. And it's in the King James. We got to help our women understand this. The word there is whore. Not because you were with five and six and seven, but because you were with one that was not your husband. Our young children need to understand Male and female, what we're talking about with women tonight, just how serious it is to keep yourself pure. To not let the world set the standard for what that means. Back to Titus chapter two, I better get to moving. Uh, he was to teach the, the older women were to teach the younger women to be keepers at home, workers in the home. And I can see some of us cringing already. And as you think about this word, this is, uh, this requirement does not address the idea per se of staying at home. Do you realize that a woman could stay at home all the time and not be a keeper or a worker in the home? Just being there does not make you a worker in the home. All right. The idea is that she is to teach the younger women to be domestically inclined, to be attentive to domestic concerns, to be a hard worker in the home a good housekeeper, a good homemaker, not to neglect the domestic affairs or the duty of the family, to teach the young woman how to keep a neat and attractive home, to teach them how to cook. It's not a badge of honor for a woman, a young lady to walk around saying, I don't know how to cook or clean, shame. Let me tone it down. To do laundry? The wife's primary place of business, I said primary, not only, but her primary place of business is in her household. Somebody says, or Brother Benjamin, what about the virtuous woman? 
Oh, she was engaged in economic affairs outside of the home. That is true. But you, when you read those passages, you'll see she was involved in economic affairs, but never to the neglect of her family. You look at Proverbs 31 and verse number 16, it talks about how she considered a field and she would buy it. And with the fruits or the profits of her hands, she would plant a vineyard. Yes, she was business minded. And Proverbs 31 and verse number 24, it says that she would make linen garments and sell them. She would deliver sashes to the merchants. Yes, but don't overlook verses like Proverbs 31 and verse number 15, where it says that she would arise early in the morning before she got off into the business day. She would arise early in the morning while it was still dark to provide food for her household and portions for her maid. And she got up early to cook, to make sure everybody had their food. Proverbs 31 and verse number 27, she looks well, she looked well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness or laziness. Her children rise up. Proverbs 31, 28, this is how we know she doesn't neglect them. Her children rise up and call her blessed. And her husband praises her. With all of my heart, I believe this. That Christian women should be the best housekeepers and homemakers that there are because they should realize that this is divine service, which can be done for the glory of God. And older women should try to instill the high honor of serving the Lord, Listen, the high honor honor of serving the Lord in the home as a wife and mother. Rather than working in industry or business and neglecting the home and family. Now, I know someone saying, Brother Benjamin, that's hard for me to receive. I know someone disagrees with that. But why? Is it because of what the Bible says or is it because of our culture? Or is it the way that we've been conditioned to be and to think as Americans? The idea that somehow being a wife and a mother, something that God places on a pedestal is beneath and less than, says who? Not God. They ought to teach the older women. Older women ought to teach the younger women to be good, caring, thoughtful, and kind, pleasant in nature. Young women need to be taught how to live for others, how to be hospitable, to be gracious and generous. And then lastly, you see these things, they just, how to be obedient, submissive, in subjection to their husbands. And you see, that's not popular. It's not popular. Society completely objects that concept. A wife, a woman being obedient to her husband. Many women have removed this from their wedding vows. Some women even support, proclaim Christian women refuse the very notion of being in subjection to any man, even her husband. But you know, it's still in the Bible. In his wisdom, God placed the husband in charge of the wife and family. He bears the authority. God in 
his wisdom. First Corinthians 11 and three. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Ephesians chapter five, verses 22 through 24. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Colossians 3 and verse number 18, wives submit yourselves unto your husbands as it is fit in the Lord. To be in subjection, to live under the authority of your husband, to yield to his admonition and his advice. No, this does not require a woman to do what's wrong, what's contrary to the word of God. Even if her husband demands it, no one has the right to demand someone to do what's contrary to the will of God and commit sin. No. But you see, Older women have to help the younger women understand that although there is a spiritual equality between men and women, there remain physical, positional, and functional differences in the home and the church. There are designated functions for a husband and a wife which cannot be changed by man because God has ordained. Oh man, I've got more to say, but I'm not. And why is this so important? Why is it so important that the godly women be reverent in their behavior? Not false accusers, not enslaved to wine, teachers are good. Why is it so important that they teach the young women to love their children and love their husbands, to be discreet and chaste and good homemakers? and submit to their husbands. Why? He says, so that the word of God be not blasphemed. So that the gospel of our Lord be not slandered or reviled or defamed or to be spoken evil of or discredited. Paul was conscious of the reproach brought upon the Lord's cause by inconsistent lies by the inconsistent lives of his people. I know our world. I know some might think that Paul's words to Timothy are chauvinistic, that they're outdated, and that they prevent women from attaining their full potential but understand who's wiser than God, no one. And the gospel makes everyone who adheres to it better in every aspect. It does not depress their good qualities or their value. It makes everyone, male and female, better who adheres to God's sound teaching. Where are you this evening? Where are you, sisters, even brothers? And I just want to encourage us. This, these lessons are so important. Because you see, if we're going to please the Lord, it's going to call for us to be counter to our culture. It's in a lot of ways we are going to have to go against the grain of what society says and what society says is normal. And sometimes it's so hard to accept what God says because we've been so trained by the world. We've been so trained by what's normal and what's right and what should be by the wrong source. Do 
you're here tonight, haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, oh, we plead with you, we beg you. It's the greatest decision any man or woman could ever make. That's the decision to follow Jesus. Will you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Will you repent of your past sins, Acts 2.38, confess that Jesus is the Christ, and be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins? Mark 16.16, 16. for those of us who are in Christ, I pray that we'll always do everything that we can to conform ourselves to the will of God. Whatever your need may be, if we can pray for you or help you in any way, please make it known as we sing our song of encouragement.